Welcome to the Isaiah Project. This prophet of God in his writings in the fifth chapter, verse 13, after observing the condition of his own people, came to the conclusion and said, therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. This was the knowledge of God. Today, regardless of one's ethnicity, political affiliation, or personal beliefs, there are evil forces that seek to continue and prolong the deprivation of sufficient knowledge for all of God's people and the world itself. The effort to possess, control, and manipulate the masses are more evident than ever before. The Isaiah Project has the mandate to bring knowledge that is essential for the betterment of our lives, our homes, our churches, our communities, and even this entire nation. Welcome again to the Isaiah Project. I'm your host, Dr. Melvin Johnson. You know, today, we have a tendency to even fall and believe in things that are not necessarily true. And when we fall for these belief systems, we become victims by acknowledging these things might be real and they even may be true. That's the way the enemy works. But today I want to spend some time with you in discussing evolution, which is actually the foundation for modern racism. Now, many of us may still live under what I would call a residual influence of Darwinism and evolution, which primarily points to the fact that there are races that are superior and greater and better than other races as far as the human condition. There are beliefs that myself as a black American have experienced in, in my days, particularly in my days of youth, where I have been subjected to different forms of racial discrimination, but through the knowledge and the power of Jesus Christ, I now stand in victory, acknowledging and knowing that as a child of God, there is no one greater, no person better than who I am as I stand before you today. But there still can be some residual thought, some residual feelings that transcend time and uh, it can even be, let's say, passively transformed or transferred even to generations to come. But the thing what we want to do today is to work together to address the issues. Now one of the things that I'm not going to do is to argue Darwinism and evolution tit for tat. You, well, I'm not here to trade uh, points of view back and forth. But one thing I will do is as I say, not necessarily address uh, the different aspects of evolutionary theory, but one thing I assure you that we all can look at, analyze, and begin to understand the effects of evolutionary theory, evolutionary policy, and practice as it has affected humanity itself. So the effect of the Socio, socio uh, psychological conditioning that has been administered over the decades and over the years through religious, cultural, and even educational institutions, uh, we still have an issue to address. Today, many position evolution as being true, the absolute truth, but if evolution is true, that means that I myself am inferior, of which I will never ever believe in, nor I don't have to confess to it or admit it, because we're all creations of God. 
So uh, if we look around, we see that there are, there are many different groups, races, uh, ethnic groups, all types of people. And the only primary difference is maybe skin color, hair, and maybe a few other minor differences. But beyond that, that's all there is. We all have all of the same parts. God didn't make us any different. But we have to come together to understand that evolution is not the truth. God's word is the truth. He created each of us equal. He created each of us as people who can understand, people who have been given the free will to do as we please, we still are basically and still are the same. So in taking an examination of evolution and as far as how it has been such a major tool in the racial agenda, that has affected this entire earth, this entire world. Let us go back for a moment and look at the one who is credited to have been the, uh, let's say, the uh, founder of modern evolutionary thought, and I mean Charles Darwin. Now, if we can go back to the time at the, at the waning years, the waning period, of slavery itself in the United States. Uh, the abolitionist movement was gaining significant uh, momentum. People were beginning to get more Bibles and were beginning to read more of God's word and begin to understand more about themselves as well as other people. Slavery at that point also was around the world, except in the Islamic world, which is still prevalent and very prominent and is practiced as I stand before you today. But the other, but other nations, uh, Europe, North, uh, well, North and South America, that includes us, other places around the world, slavery became an anathema, uh, an, uh, an evil of which most people reject it. But at that time, let's say in the mid 1800s, and we get up to the point where we have the Civil War and we have uh, the South losing, but something had happened right before that. Again, as I say, as people began to understand that, that uh, people are, all people are equal, even the slaves, they were not, they should not have been slaves and people were beginning to have their minds changed. In the year 1859, Charles Darwin came forth with his book, Origin of Species. And so uh, I want to spend a little time again focusing on him and in essence he can his writing his his book itself was initially written to justify slavery and uh, in the case of western civilization the underlying cornerstone for racism um, became the work of the english naturalist charles darwin so origin of species when he published it he is the initial uh, number of books that were uh, published were about 1,200, and they were grabbed up almost immediately. And we see it today as a systematic theory of logic and reasoning, who which rejects God and establishes the white race as the rulers, as a supreme superior group uh, in this world, and. Uh, it is not the exclusive doctrine of the atheist who lives without the creator. It is not just the atheist. Uh, it was also absorbed into many Christian uh, 
cultures and many Christian groups that thought on the, um, you know, uh, of a superior group of people. Um, now, I want to share with you uh, two different approaches to minorities at that time. Charles Darwin, and then I will, uh, he was one because uh, what he had done, he had went to, uh, let's say, a remote uh, island uh, place and found a population of people. And then there was another perspective. Uh, uh, before Darwin, uh, we can see what Christopher Columbus uh, saw when he saw uh, an isolated group of people, a population uh, that was also on the island in the uh, uh, West Indies, actually. Charles Darwin's version, his view was uh, the people that he came in contact with were uh, uh, from a superior slash inferior uh, perspective where the indigenous people they were condemned there was no hope in them ever uh, being saved there was no reason to share the gospel with them because um, they were subhuman <clears throat> Dar Darwin saw the natives of Tierra del Fuego he said I could not have believed how wide was the difference between savage and civilized man. It is greater than between the wild and the domesticated animal. Inasmuch as in man there is a greater power of improvement, viewing such men, one can hardly make oneself believe that they are fellow creatures and inhabitants of the same world. That was Charles Darwin's view of people different from him, the natives of the island of Tierra del Fuego. And um, so in essence, what he was saying, there was no need for them to be saved. There was no need for them. Why? Because they were uh, lower than uh, uh, the white race. The other approach was by Christopher Columbus. And uh, like Darwin was the case of su superior, inferior, Christopher Columbus's f uh, perspective was what I call uh, a, uh, so, uh, a need versus provider, okay, or need slash provider. In other words, Christopher Columbus, he had in his heart, he had in his mind, and part of his motivation to explore the West was uh, to take the gospel to those who had not heard it. And so he looked at the indigenous people uh, that, and saw and wrote that they were entitled to hear the gospel and enjoy the benefits and blessings of God. You know, many people today uh, disparage Christopher Columbus and say all kinds of negative things about him. They uh, accuse him of purposely and intentionally bringing diseases to the, the Native American culture. They accuse him of being a racist, and but, the, but that that is history being rewritten because I, as I repeat one of his quotes in his log, he described the natives as being friendly and well dispositioned, having handsome bodies and very fine faces, with eyes that were very large and very pretty. He had, and he praised their docility. He conducted, he concluded, I think they can easily be made Christians for they seem to have no religion. He wrote that on October the 12th in 1492 into his log. So those are two different views of humanity other than whites in the superior race. So we, if, if we recognize that, uh, it, it would help us to better understand uh, uh, the effects, <clears throat> and I mean the negative effects of evolution itself. Uh, we call the practice of being racist institutionalized racism. There are two heads of it. There are two groups. Um, there's a religious group, as I had uh, quoted uh, Charles Darwin. I'm sorry, uh, as I quoted, uh, uh, yeah, Charles Darwin and his perspective. 
And um, then there's a scientific group. I include him in that group also. Uh, the uh, institutionalized racism is it believes in the uh, from the scientific view. Uh, it, it believes that the most evolved species of man rules all things, including the lower species of men. And it's important that we who are Christians <clears throat> to uh, stay with uh, God's word and to use the scriptures that we may be able to uh, confront a racist ideology, particularly within the body of Christ. <clears throat> this is called nuthetic confrontation. And I share a scripture with you out of Colossians uh, 3 and 16, and this is what Paul urges. Um, and, and I'm going to use... Um, I'm going to use a, a, the translation uh, to neuthetically counseling or neuthetically confrontation, confrontations to make my point. And uh, in Colossians 3 and 16, Paul urges us, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and, and this is for the, for, for the moment with the translation, confronting one another neuthetically challenging one another when we find ourselves out of the way or, or, or away from God's true meaning and true word. What is an example of this? Paul himself had to deal with a race issue and uh, he uh, had to neuthetically confront Peter. This is found in Galatians, the, chap uh, cha the second chapter, verses 11 through 14. And the account of, it goes, of that event goes as follows, as Paul writes. But when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him face to face. I challenged him neuthetically because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. And, but when they were present, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews then assembled likewise with him, inasmuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimul dissimulation. In other words, at Antioch, when Peter was there and no other Jews were around, Peter fellowshiped with the Gentiles. They were fellow Christians, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But when other Jews came around, Peter decided that he could not fellowship with them. And Paul himself confronted him about that issue. Because in the 14th verse, Paul concludes that, But when I saw <clears throat> that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest in the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compel thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? In other words, it was as if Peter himself was trying to force the Gentiles to live and act as Jews so that he can be comfortable instead of him remaining comfortable and, 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 and accept it and accepting of the Gentiles when other Jews were not around. So Paul had to confront him. And so the issue is, if we want a winning strategy, is to confront racial hatred through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so let, let me move to another venue, another item of focus. We know um, that when we have taught that abortion itself is a form of racially driven hatred. It is part of the evolutionary ideology, the survival of the fittest. And in, in one of the points, uh, one of the premises of being able to survive as the fittest is to Eliminate and or control the population of what may be considered the unfit. <clears throat> For a moment, I'll focus attention on one of the uh, associate justices of our Supreme Court, even today, Ruth Vader Ginsburg.
In an astonishing admission, U U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Vader Ginsburg says she was under the impression that legalizing abortion with the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, the case, it would eliminate undesirable members of the populace, or as she put it, populations that we don't want to have too many of. Now this is a consistent, has been a consistent theme of uh, one of our primary political parties, the Democrat Party itself. It supports abortion on demand as well as the majority of its leaders and members itself. Ruth Vader Ginsburg again says uh, that I thought that Roe v. Wade was to rid undesirables. Now who are the undesirables? The undesirables are people who they believe should be controlled, who are, who are uh, inferior to them. This is one of the effects, one of the end results of evolutionary theory. So it's very important that we recognize that. This is one of the outcomes, one of the side effects of evolutionary theory. Another side effect, another outcome of evolutionary theory based upon the belief, the premise that God does not exist. Everything happened through this cosmic accident through uh, the accumulation of gases, and then the gases exploded and the universe came into existence. And all of these, all of, all of the, these uh, thoughts and ideologies and philosophies that come along with it. Uh, here we are as living, thinking beings. And through evolutionary policy, there has to be some form of order. In other words, who or what controls humanity? Is there confusion? Is there chaos? Man's effort, aside from God's word, his effort is to establish rules and regulations and laws of itself. And this is what we call government a system that is designed to keep order in society. <clears throat> now, I want to make a comparative study real quickly between God's word and creation as compared to evolution itself. First of all, we can look under our belief, our faith in God, our knowledge of God, we know that he is a moral God. Evolution says that there is no God. Man is. Our laws, particularly even in this nation, our, our constitution, our beliefs, our heritage from the time of the founding fathers even up to today, we know, we believe, and, and, and accept and practice the fact that the laws come from the creator, God himself. Evolution says that man, that these laws, man's laws should come from man. He's the organizer and the uh, supreme person, the supreme man. He writes the laws. He enforces the laws. He is the one who is the source of order in this world. And I'll show you uh, in a little bit later that when we try to place man in that position, man causes more chaos and turmoil than a a anything else can happen. Thirdly, where do we get our rights from? As we look at the Declaration of Independence, we see that our founding fathers acknowledge, they recognize that every human being, every person, every person born and even yet to be born, 
we have certain unalienable rights. And these rights come from the Creator. And among these rights are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We appeal to God. We see God as the supreme uh, arbiter of the human experience. That we get our laws, our rights, everything comes from him. But on the evolutionary side, human rights are granted by the government. And we can look around and we can see, and I'll share with you uh, some more information on this. Um, but when government is able to provide our rights, government is also able to take away our rights. When we allow people to determine what our rights are, they also have the power, the authority, and the will and desire to change them whenever they see fit. Those are dangerous things. And uh, we believe under the Judeo-Christian philosophy that government is ordained of God, therefore committed to maintain order and punish evil. From the evolutionary side, government is all powerful and it is able to do whatever it pleases, whenever it pleases. And as, as we would look around at some of the socialistic and even communistic nations, we will find that people are not trying to go over there. Let, let me just say, like going to, no one is trying to escape the United States to go to Cuba. Nobody's trying to escape the United States to go to North Korea. Nobody's trying to escape the United States to go to China or any of the other communist nations. These people are doing what they can, risking it in their own lives to get here. So that is very significant. This brings to an end this part of our discussion on evolution. And I want to thank you for listening. Thank God for your patience. And we certainly deserve, I ask for your support of the Isaiah Project, as well as God's Learning Channel. So again, thank you for listening. I'm Dr. Melvin Johnson, your host. Goodbye, and God bless you. Order your copy of this program from the GLC Bookstore by calling the numbers or visiting the website on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering. Shalom. I'm Muddle Ballastin, a Jewish believer in Messiah Jesus and one of the teachers here at GLC. I've been very impressed with the ministry in my visits, and I understand how much they do with the few dollars that are sent in. Your investment here will go a long way. I encourage God's people to be supportive of God's work as it's being done here at GLC. Lord bless you, and shalom. The Dred Scott decision of 1857 was a major legal event and a catalyst that contributed to the Civil War. The decision declared that Dred Scott could not be free because he was not a citizen. The 14th Amendment, also called the Dred Scott Amendment, granted citizenship to all born or naturalized here. Up to now, there has been no stamp for Dred Scott. This is a rendition of a design concept created by Mark Carroll for the Dred Scott Heritage Foundation. Join the Dred Scott stamp campaign at www.dredscottlives.org. Hey, God bless you. This is Pastor Humberto Porras. Just want to remind you that GLC is in need of your help. 